Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Boker Tov. Uh, <coughs> we're five minutes late, and I've got 30 minutes, so you'll excuse me if I'll rush through this. But uh, <coughs> just a very brief introduction. Uh, I am a cardiologist. Um <coughs> I've been working for the last uh, probably 10 years with the pharmaceutical industry. I'm a medical director of a uh, core lab. Uh, and as part of my work, I do have the opportunity to see many new drugs in development and uh, <coughs> both help the design and the conduct of those studies as well as presenting them to the regulators. Uh, so some of this is very close to my heart, but obviously the question uh, for many of you clinicians is whether <coughs> QT or the QT interval is something you should be concerned with or is this something that is pretty much limited to the regulatory process and consideration. Uh, so I'll, I'll break my <coughs> talk into two parts, first the clinical evidence and then uh, some of the more uh, regulatory and drug development aspects. Uh, I spoke with one of my dear old colleagues. Uh, I'm not going to give guidelines today, but I think that the guidelines are certainly due, uh, and these will not be specifically for QT, but more comprehensively for <coughs> cardio-oncology treatment from assessment through uh, <coughs> treatment and so on. Nevertheless, the reason that we're concerned with uh, QT prolongation is not because of the QT. QT is non-painful, non-harmful on itself, and uh, obviously one can tolerate a considerable increase in the QT interval. The concern is arrhythmia, uh, and the typical arrhythmia is Toussaint de Point, which was described originally by a French cardiologist, de Sautin, in 1969, and this was then called quinidine syncope because it was associated with drug-induced uh, quinidine and antiarrhythmic. And this is a uh, typical example from the original <coughs> uh, paper. Going back into the molecular basis, and I'll just have three slides, so hopefully not bother you with this. Uh, <coughs> we're talking, obviously, about either congenital mutations or drug interaction uh, with one of the channels. Here are represented three channels that are affecting either the AV node or the PR interval, <coughs> the calcium channel, the sodium channel, which is affecting the QRS duration, depolarization, and the potassium channel, which is primarily responsible for repolarization, action potential duration, uh, <coughs> and is the culprit for many drugs that are causing QT prolongation and potentially exposing patients to Tossin de Point. Uh, and this is the <coughs> an illustration of the, of the channel itself. This is the, the bilayer membrane. The channel, as you can see, is a funnel shape. Uh, in most small molecules, and it has been stated that about 80% of small molecules, if you give them in a high enough concentration, will interact with the inter internal uh, residua on this channel and will block the channel, theref thereby obviously causing <coughs> disruption in the normal mechanism that creates or establishes the action potential duration, which translates, obviously, onto the <coughs> electrocardiogram. Uh, having said so, the mechanism or the typical mechanism is prolongation of the action potential duration and then a spontaneous provocation of an early after depolarization, which is the initiation of a repetitive and consecutive uh, beat. <coughs> This sometimes requires a trigger. This could be a premature beat, but it also requires a substrate, a ground on which to uh, obviously proliferate. And this substrate is the inhomogeneity of repolarization. Certain myocardial cells uh, will have different uh, lengths of the action potential prolongation. This dispersion of repolarization uh, <coughs> can be represented and has been shown to be represented by the distance between the T peak to T end or QT peak minus QT end. Uh, as QT peak to QT end prolongs, there is an evidence or indirect evidence for increased uh, <coughs> dispersion of repolarization. Uh, and as I said, together with the <coughs> trigger, this will result or potentially may result in uh, arrhythmia. Uh, I don't have to tell the cardiologists of you that uh, Tosadapua is potentially a lethal arrhythmia. It, uh, in two thirds of the cases or more, it recovers or resolves spontaneously. Okay, I'm sorry, as I said, I've got uh, 10 minutes and 30 slides. <coughs> I'll go slow. Uh, <coughs> so, <coughs> where was I? The combination of the trigger, uh, a premature beat, and the substrate uh, will obviously initiate this uh, potentially lethal arrhythmia. 
Uh, now, everything that we know about QT prolongation actually comes from the congenital long QT. Uh, <coughs> where am I going? Okay. Uh, <coughs> and again, I'm not going to bother you, and I don't have time uh, to show you this, but as you can see, the, the list of uh, spontaneous congenital mutation uh, only increases the calprite or the targets uh, are listed here. Uh, and the one that we're looking at is... <coughs> Uh, long QT2, uh, which affects the rapid component of the inward potassium channel, the IKR, and this is a loss of function. You can see the arrow down, down towards down is a loss of function, up is gain of function. Uh, and this is responsible for about a third of congenital long QT, uh, and because we don't have epidemiological data on drug-induced QT prolongation other than clinical trials, which are very limited in size and scope. Uh, most of our information is coming from LQT2, which is, as I said, a, uh, if you'd like, a, a real-life uh, example of drug-induced long QT. Uh, and as this slide shows, uh, there is a, uh, possibly, I mean, obviously, the, it's never arbitrary, but there is a cutoff. So when a QT prolongation or either congenital or drug-induced QT prolongation, exceed a certain threshold, uh, the likelihood of uh, <coughs> potentially malignant arrhythmia increases significantly. This threshold has been uh, <coughs> established at 500 milli millisecond, and that's what we're currently looking at in terms of guidelines for clinical treatment as well as guidelines for drug-induced QT prolongation. Uh, the risk is a continuous risk, and as you can see, as the QT interval or the corrected heart rate corrected QT interval increases, so does the uh, risk <coughs> of developing a, uh, <coughs> an event at Osana uh, And again, you can see this illustrated in this slide. Uh, the rate of the event is proportional uh, to the amount of QT prolongation. <coughs> The regulators are maintaining their own safety database. Uh, some of you may be aware of the FDA, <coughs> and there are other regulators also that have this uh, event <coughs> uh, registry or the AERS. The AERS records adverse events based on the, again, the, the trigger or the, the culprite. And here you can see adverse events spontaneously reported by American physician to the FDA uh, by the <coughs> various components, whether it's acute prolongation, QRS prolongation, uh, and PR prolongation. And you can see in the blue line that QT is obviously the most uh, widely and frequently reported adverse event. Uh, and as I said previously, QT in itself is obviously non-painful, non-harmful. Uh, but in this case, the trigger for the report was arrhythmia. So these are arrhythmia related to either QT prolongation, QRS prolongation, or potentially heart blocks due to <coughs> PR prolongation. Uh, and, and in one of the seminars work published 20 years ago, uh, <coughs> this was quantified into a direct relationship between the QT interval prolongation and the risk of cardiac events, primarily malignant arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. Uh, and as you can see, the, the relationship are linear, direct, uh, and the risk is quantifiable. Uh, <coughs> So from this point on, I think that it would be very difficult to argue that QT prolongation is indeed non-painful, non-harmful, uh, but that it doesn't carry a certain level and degree of harm, uh, and that we should all, as clinicians, uh, <coughs> should be concerned with this. And <coughs> jumping uh, forward to the regulatory aspect, so the regulators have obviously been observing uh, those reports, spontaneous reports, the adverse event, the sudden death. Uh, with regard to drug, um, <coughs> drug induced side effects, which is obviously the remit. Uh, and as you can see here, I'm sorry, keep pressing the wrong one. <coughs> as you can see here, this is a, uh, <coughs> a breakdown of uh, <coughs> the number of drugs presented as orphan designation to the EMA, the European Agency. Uh, I don't have the American uh, numbers for this. And as you can see, oncology has recently become uh, probably the primary therapeutic area for drug development. This is uh, represented not only by the size or the number of new drugs, it's also represented by the amount of work that we see uh, <coughs> in terms of clinical research and clinical development. Uh, having said so, <coughs> 
the <coughs> reasons for drugs not making it to the market can either be failure during the, during the drug development, the pre-approval, or post-approval. Uh, <coughs> and as you can see, the cardiovascular side effects account for about one quarter, uh, very similar to liver toxicity, yet uh, this has triggered a dedicated uh, regulatory guidelines called the ICAG-14, which I'll show you in a second, uh, whereas all of the others did not gain, receive, or been awarded, if you'd like, a regulatory guidance. The reason is that the kind of complications are much more fatal. The fatality case is probably two to four times higher than all of the others. Uh, so clearly this became a public concern, it became a regulatory concern, it became a public issue, and hence we're talking on and discussing this today. Now, the other aspect or the other face of the coin is the post-approval. What happens after the drug has been approved, the drug is on the market, you as physicians are able to prescribe the drug. Uh, and again, you can see that Tosa de Pumois, this malignant arrhythmia that I told you about, accounts for about one-third of those <coughs> uh, <coughs> so-called high-profile withdrawals. These are drugs that have caused sudden cardiac death, have been reported to the regulators due through the AERS, etc and has been withdrawn from the market either voluntarily or by, uh, obviously, request of the regulators. Other cardiovascular events, and these are the events that we've been discussing yesterday and today, including heart failure, including valvular, pericardial, and myocardial, account for about 13% <coughs> of post-approval withdrawal. So this only gives you the scope, the scale of the issue from a drug development perspective. <coughs> So again, I mean, translating this into clinical uh, guidelines, most of you will be primarily concerned with these 13%. The regulators, the public as a public, and obviously drug development, is concerned with all of this, and primarily uh, the antiarrhythmia <coughs> aspect. Uh, so this is a big issue for us in the industry. It's a big issue for the regulators, and it's a big public issue. There are millions of dollars that are going just for research uh, to do this. So I'll show you a few examples, if I still have time. <coughs> Three more minutes. Uh, <coughs> one is a TKI, excuse me, <coughs> uh, lapatinib, and I think that lapatinib has been described before. Uh, lapatinib is not only <coughs> uh, causing cardiomyopathy in terms of heart failure, uh, hypertension, which I'll talk about later, but has also been shown to be uh, significantly associated with QT prolongation. This is concentration versus effect, uh, a very common analysis within the industry, and I'm sure that all of you have seen those graphs before. This is the mean effect. These are the confidence intervals, upper and lower confidence intervals. And you can see that at the maximum concentration, if you extrapolate the concentration to the effect, you can see a mean QT prolongation compared to baseline of about 15 milliseconds which is above the regulatory threshold. The regulatory threshold has been set at 10 milliseconds, so any drug uh, that is causing QT prolongation by low, if you'd like, is allowed to cause up to 10, oh, thank you so much, 10. <coughs> 10 milliseconds. If it exceeds the 10 milliseconds, it goes into the red. If it exceeds the 20 milliseconds, it's deep in the red. Uh, however, the regulators are also considering the benefit-risk ratio. Obviously, we're dealing here with life-threatening conditions, and these are potentially life-saving uh, treatments. Therefore, the regulatory tolerance for QT prolongation and potential arrhythmic events is uh, much higher. And therefore, oncology drugs are usually approved based on 20 millisecond cutoff, as opposed to all other uh, mainly small molecules that are approved based on 10 millisecond cutoff. Uh, so this obviously illustrates uh, <coughs> the fact that uh, although lapatinib has exceeded the regulatory threshold for non-oncology drugs, it has been approved, uh, and as I'll show you in a minute, most of these drugs are approved, but they are approved with a label restriction. This is telling you, the prescribers, the physicians, uh, that this drug, in addition to all of the, uh, the other things, may cause QT prolongation, probably should not be given together with other drugs known to cause QT prolongation, uh, and should be <coughs> uh, also, what's the word, <coughs> adjusted to other conditions, i.e. the patient should, uh, should not have any electrolyte abnormalities, obviously hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia is well known, risk factors for TOSAD in combination with QT prolongation, etc. Uh, so these are all part of the guidelines. And this is the guidelines itself, this is the so-called ICAG-14, 
ICH, for those of you who are not familiar, is the uh, top pharmaceutical and regulatory organization. It's represented equally by the pharma industry, by the regulators, and a uh, representative of the public. It's called International Conference on Harmonization. That's how it started. Uh, and there are topics, usually a letter and a number. The E14 is the QT guidelines, uh, <clears throat> and it primarily is concerned with non antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, because antiarrhythmic drugs by design cause, many of them are causing cutie prolongation. It's a different story. And just in the last uh, three slides, I'll show you. These are the, <coughs> some data from the FDA. Uh, <coughs> so you can see here on the axis, number of slides from number of drugs that has been presented to the uh, agency from 1 to 46. You can see the QT prolongation. Uh, and this is very illustratively, obviously, the green zone or the, if you'd like, the <laughs> non qt prolongers be below the 10 millisecond, uh, the, the blue, which is on a traffic light, the yellow zone, which is between 10 and 20 millisecond, and the red zone, which is above 20 millisecond. Uh, and you can see that there is a significant number of drugs <coughs> that are above 20 millisecond, about 83% of them, that have been approved despite having, if you'd like, a massive QT prolongation. They've been approved on the basis of benefit-risk ratio because they're beneficial, because they're potentially helpful for human and mankind, uh, but not without precaution, restrictions, and warning. And these are the label warnings. Uh, <clears throat> and what I wanted to show you here is that the majority of these drugs are actually oncology drugs. If you look here, you can see the different therapeutic uh, areas, and you can see that there are two or three drugs in each one of them. Oncology has become, not only because of the wide pipeline of showing you that <coughs> oncology and drug development is now the major therapeutic area, but also in terms of QT prolongation, proarrhythmia, and sudden death, oncology became a major culprit for the public, for the regulators, uh, and I assume for all of us. Uh, and again, as I've <coughs> shown you before, this is due to various uh, <coughs> restrictions. And I'll just whiz forward. Uh, so there, there are multiple examples, and I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through all of them. Uh, but just to summarize, if you'll allow me to skip forward and summarize. So the question remains, is QT prolongation a clinical problem, or is it a regulatory problem, or could it be both? Uh, <clears throat> the answer, obviously, depends on who you ask and who you're talking with. Uh, as I said, for regulators, for industry, for people who are looking at the public uh, aspects, uh, this is a major issue. I appreciate that for most of you, on a day-to-day -day basis, as I said, QT prolongation is non-painful, possibly non-harmful. Uh, but I would like to mention and remind you that the reason that you don't see TOSAD or people dropping dead because of TOSAD is primarily because of those massive efforts that have been put into <coughs> developing safer drugs. Uh, so now we've got dedicated QT studies. As I said, there are millions and hundreds of millions. It has been estimated at about $1 billion has been spent on assessing QT prolongation in the industry since E14 came into effect in 2005. This is $1 billion in 10 years. So I'll leave you with this, and hopefully there is a take-home message for some of you. Others would not be convinced. I appreciate this, and thank you very much.